It's Tuesday, November 20th. Welcome to Market Foolery. I'm Chris Hill, joining me in studio from MFAM Funds, the one and only Bill Barker. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. It is a short week for us here at Market Foolery. We are off on Wednesday. We are off, obviously, for Thanksgiving. The market is closed. So, normally in these situations, I would say, hey, check out Industry Focus, which is the other daily podcast from The Motley Fool. Industry Focus is also taking Wednesday and Thursday off. So, I'm going to say, hey, if you haven't listened to Rule Breaker Investing with David Gardner, absolutely, you should be checking that out. And Motley Fool Answers. Listen to it two or three times, because you've got your schedules opened up. Your schedule's opened up, and particularly in the case of Rule Breaker Investing, those episodes, the shelf life for the episodes that David Gardner does. Skip this episode, yeah. go right over to Rule Breaker, give it two or three listens right now. Yeah, I get think, more out of it. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Can I, we wrap? No, no, we're oh, going to keep going. Oh, but <laughs> I think I think your point is spot on that people will get more out of whatever is uh, David Gardner is talking about this week than whatever we're about to talk about. Actually, we're we're going to talk about the um, the retail ugliness that is happening right now, and we saw we saw this coming last week when Home Depot put up an amazing stellar quarter and the stock dropped anyway, and now we've got. Retailers putting up less than stellar quarters and just getting punished for it. And we'll start with Target. Uh, third quarter results coming in below expectations. Um, and y- you can look at what Target is doing in terms of their investment in uh, the supply chain and think, well, long term, that makes sense. And I applaud that. And that's fine. But in the short term, that just means the Target's costs are going higher. Uh, stock down 9% this morning. Yeah, the stock going into today was up 22% for the year and up 37% from this time last year. So let's uh, pull that apart a little bit. Uh, one thing uh, that sort of allowed that was the stock being beaten up as much as it was. There was a lot of frustration with retail uh, going into last summer 2017, and a lot of stocks uh, in the retail space really bottomed around then. So. Looking at it from that point, everything is going much better. They haven't been destroyed as of yet by Amazon, but Target's numbers show what the cost of that non-destruction is, and they had comps of 5.3 percent, which is pretty good. Uh, but there are costs associated with meeting customers in all the places they want to be, uh, and Target's investments in Sort of uh, order online, pick up in the store, or pick up at curbside. Uh, these are good things for the customer, things the customer wants, but they are not easy to deliver without raising your uh, costs. Uh, either you're going to have to raise your prices, which is not particularly viable in as competitive a retail environment uh, as we have today, or you're going to take on those costs and see your margins uh, contract, and that's where Target is today. Brian Cornell, the CEO, uh, was very clear that despite you know the the higher costs in the third quarter, he has a great deal of confidence going into the holiday quarter. Not just in terms of consumer spending, but in terms of Target's ability to deliver on that. So I think if you're a Target shareholder, you I think Brian Cornell has rightfully earned the confidence of the shareholders, uh, given his track record there. So I think you, you're you're hopefully taking some solace in Cornell's confidence. I do, and what I take less confidence in is how you construct the numbers in a way that makes it a truly exciting investment opportunity. That is, if a traditional retail, let's go back a few years where. Uh, you're going to get your comps of, of mid-single digits at a well-run place, and then you're going to open up more stores. So your total sales are going to rise, maybe in the low double digits, because you're opening more stores. You're getting bigger. Your margins are going to improve by a little bit, and then you're going to buy back some shares. And when you combine all that and get down to the bottom line, you've got growth of earnings per share, hopefully in something like the the mid uh, double digit. It's you know teens, fifteen percent. If you do everything right, and quarters are going to not always go right, but that's kind of the game plan. Well, now are you really building more stores? Uh, and if you're not building more stores, are you going to see your margins improve? As uh, because you're not really growing more than maybe the rate of the economy. 
If that's the case, you still might be able to buy back your shares, and Target did a bit of that over the quarter. Uh, but really, they were buying them back at what appears now to be higher prices than they go for after you know today. So maybe they'll buy back more shares at a lower price over the coming quarter. But if you start getting at where are the comps, and that is kind of the main number that is going to determine your your rate of growth. Well, you know, you're talking mid single digits. Let's move on to Lowe's and Lowe's third quarter not nearly as good as Home Depot's last week and uh, expectedly uh, shares of Lowe's falling today. Um, part of the confidence that I think investors might want to have in Target is the fact that despite the higher costs in the third quarter, Target um, didn't change their guidance for the full fiscal year. That is not the case with Lowe's, because in addition to their third quarter numbers, they also um, cut their forecast. Yeah, well, they are, uh, as we just went over, part of the equation here in traditionally would be that you have good comp numbers and that allows you to open more stores. Well, Lowe's is now in the process of closing stores and uh, they are saying that uh, I, th- I think 31 um, stores in, in Canada, um, 20. Um, in in uh, the U.S., uh, you know they they are contracting uh, in terms of their store count. So where is the growth going to come from there? I'm not saying that that is the wrong business decision. If you have over supplied in terms of stores and you've got too many too close together, I think most of the stores that they've announced that are going to be eliminated are within 10 miles of of another store. So they're going to be more efficient. That'll help the comp numbers in the remaining stores once it's completed. But you've got to take a big charge to earnings to close those stores, and that's what's befalling Lowe's stock today. Well, and you throw in the fact that previously Lowe's had announced that it was closing all of its Orchard Supply hardware stores, which was a smaller brand in the Lowe's portfolio. So. This can all make a lot of sense, and these can all be the right decisions. But I think if you're looking at Lowe's in 2019, 2019 is shaping up as a year for Marvin Ellison and his team at Lowe's, where they really need to deliver. Because if 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 this year has been well, we need to take a hard look at how we manage our inventory. We need to take a hard look at our locations, and yes, we're going to close Orchard Supply, and yes, we're going to methodically close certain locations in North America. That's fine, but they really need to deliver next year. Yeah, and you can be more confident in that delivery occurring if the housing market is really healthy and the housing market is beginning to show signs in the wake of interest rates moving up and mortgage rates also moving up of a softening in the housing market. It's all these markets are really local and some are doing better than others, but nationally, uh, there's been slowdown. I think the numbers out yesterday um, showed that the home builder confidence was at a low, two year low. And so that's an issue. Margins uh, are also an issue. The cost of lumber has been going up in large part due to uh, some of the tariffs and uh, the lumber coming in from Canada. So there are a lot of different. Uh, Moving pieces, uh, sort of all of which are moving in the wrong direction for Lowe's, other than the economy in general, which is still quite healthy, and uh, that's that's uh, more use than uh, maybe just about anything. But the housing economy specifically is a problem. So, if the housing is really if housing is really that bad, I and mean, housing, I would I don't want to say housing is bad. It's softening. Okay. Which is different. I don't want to oversell the problems in the housing market. No, no, I I appreciate that. But we've talked for years about how for people who are have not invested in housing, that one of the best, easiest entry points for an investor looking at individual stocks is Home Depot and Lowe's, because over time they've been steady businesses. At various points, one has done better than the other, but. Generally, they have been seen as safer investments than a straight-up home builder, or you know that sort of thing. And if now 
Sorry to keep going back to last week, but like if, if Home Depot is going to put up a third quarter like they just did, and the stock is going to drop because there are all of these concerns about the housing industry, then that makes me wonder if there's anything related to the housing market in terms of stocks that's worth buying right now. Well, I think uh, Home Depot is is still uh, at disclosure. I own some shares of Home Depot. Uh, probably the place I would be most confident in. Uh, a, a sustainable floor. That is, housing builders, uh, home builders. Boy, you get some wild, wild swings there. When times are good, they skyrocket, and when times are bad, they look like they're going bankrupt. And Home Depot is a far more, yeah, you know, lower, lower ceiling, higher floor on that, and it's been doing a better job than Lowe's for quite some time. So. Uh, I think that uh, although there there was, as you say, weakness uh, post the earnings report, I'd rather have a good earnings report and stock weakness and vice versa. Our email address is marketfoolery at fool dot com. Question from Sam Horn in Boston, where it's about to become very cold. Uh, Sam writes, one of the first dozen of listeners here. I've noticed you guys have not mentioned L Brands over the past year, but have touched on other victims in the retail apocalypse. Would love to hear your thoughts on the long-term ability to invest in fashion slash brands. Thanks. Thank you, Sam, for that. What a coincidence! Because actually, on our schedule to discuss today, L Brands reporting third quarter results. This is the parent company of Victoria's Secret and Bath and Body Works. And um, whatever nice things showed up in the third quarter report were overshadowed by the fact that Hell Brands announced it's cutting its dividend in half. That's <laughs> that's a little surprising. Yeah, I'd, I'd be uh, hard pressed to tell you what the good things are that showed up in the third quarter, uh, given that versus expectations. Uh, well, I mean, the, the, they lost money. Uh, they had part of that was due to massive write-offs for two things. One, uh, they are eliminating uh, Henry Bendel, or maybe it's Henri Bendel. I, you, you can pronounce it however you want. <laughs> <laughs> you can get in trouble for pronouncing things wrong on this show. You've you've done it. Sure, mostly with Swedish. Your Swedish pronunciations, if yeah, serves. yeah, I struggle there. Yeah, uh, so that that's a charge, and its secondary charge, actually, a much larger charge, is uh, the eighty million dollar, although it is non cash uh, impairment charge related to uh, the Victoria's Secret store assets. So that indicates that they have spent money building stores, and they now have to write down some of those costs, because it doesn't look like they're going to recoup the investment on certain store investments. So, this is a problem. They're they're taking charges, acknowledging that they've misallocated capital, and they're shutting down a brand that was not a huge part of the business, but still not a good sign. And they generally had it more so, the weakness is really in the Victoria's Secret brand more than elsewhere. For the third quarter, uh, comps were down two percent, uh, and that is the largest chunk of the business. Comps um, were up thirteen percent at uh, Bath and Body Works, which I'm sure we'll get to, and that's a better side of the story. But the long-term trend is that the Victoria's Secret, uh, you know, is is not resonating with its customers. Uh, yeah, I was going to say that in terms of bright spots, certainly the Bath and Body Works results looked good. They raised guidance for, for the full fiscal year. That's you know theoretically uh, a bright spot. Um, yeah, Boston, Bath and Body Works. Um, so this has come up in the past because they uh, and maybe it was just about a year ago, or or maybe it was just after the holidays when. Um, uh, we were talking about their large three wick candles um, and the unusual scents that they have. Because, I mean, I've talked about the people at the Oreo division of Mondelez being drunk with power. And I think to a smaller degree, wh whoever is green lighting the various scents of candles at Bath and Body Works, um, they're just saying yes to everything. 
Yeah, you'd, you could just go back and replay rather than us revisiting <laughs> right. the, our, our thoughts on sweater weather and uh, black tie and peppered uh, suede, uh, flannel, flannel. Uh, that Would you like a flannel scented candle? Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know. It's, I think if you set flannel on if you set flannel on fire, that's usually probably not a great smell. Uh, and you're actually packing some peppermint suede right uh, no, next to you. Peppered suede. Peppered, yeah, one of the, one of the dozens uh, sent in a peppered suede candle, but here. To go back because to the... really, I mean, when you're having some suede, you know, and you think like this could do with a little more pepper, right? Now they've done it for you. Yes, you're you, welcome. You America. don't want you don't want to have any suede that is, uh, you know, bland, bland. Yeah. Um, so when we had talked about this before, uh, we were talking about the the different scents, but also the fact that this candle, which is uh, nearly a pound in weight. And yeah, in some states you have to register that. Yeah, this is, is oh yeah, this is a blunt object. Yeah, I, in fact, it wouldn't surprise me if this showed up in a police report somewhere. Where not that it burned. Not down that the we're house. advocating that. Not that we're advocating that. I'm just saying that if you wanted to use this as a weapon, you if could. you have to defend yourself, if somebody's an intruder, have a couple of uh, you know Bath and Body Works three wick candles on hand. And you got a better chance of getting out of that situation. So one of the things that I sort of took the company to task for was the fact that um, okay, you've got these unusual scents, but also you're selling this candle for nearly thirty dollars. They were they were selling these candles for twenty seven dollars, and I just thought, well, that's come on, you're not you're not going to get me interested in that. Um, it's like someone uh, just posted in the the Motley Fool podcast group on Facebook that um, the good people at Pringles. Came out with a creative box of Thanksgiving dinner flavored Pringles, which you could get me interested in that, but not if it's fifteen dollars a box, which is what they're doing. It's like, come on, Pringles, I'll, I'll try your novelty flavors, you know, but you got to make it attractive from a price point standpoint. Well, it's entirely possible someone at Bath and Body Works was listening to that podcast because you go to their website. BathandBodyWorks.com, and immediately you're bombarded with the candles. Mm -hmm. They're less than half the price they were a year ago. Yeah. They, so now they're so cheap you can't afford not to buy them. Exactly. And creative uh, scents like Merry Cookie, uh, Fresh Balsam, Twisted Peppermint. I don't know what makes uh, my hunch is that peppermint and twisted peppermint probably have similar scents, but maybe I'm wrong on that. Champagne toast, twisted peppermint's got a little bit more of an edge to it. I think. Yeah, it is. It's the edgy one. It's a good-looking uh, rebel candle that plays by its own rules. <laughs> um, vanilla snowflake, fireside. Although I don't think you want to put a large candle right next to the fire. Here's a challenging one. Okay, wine cellar. Uh, you tell me, wine cellar, and I think musty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I wouldn't think that cellar is one of those things that connotes a, a good smell. No, not really. Not any of the cellars the, that I've ever um, owned. Right. Yeah. Or that have ever appeared in movies. <laughs> <laughs> There's never been a time where you're watching a movie and they go down to the cellar and you think to yourself as a viewer, I bet that smells delightful. No, you better be armed with a candle if you're going to go down to the, the wine cellar that's in a movie, because there's usually trouble down there. You know what? We're poking a little bit of fun at Bath & Body Works in the wake of a third quarter where it was by far so much better from a business standpoint than Victoria's Secret was. Yeah. Well, I think it, it's that a part of that reason is that for us to go into the details of the of what is sold at Victoria's Secret is just a danger zone that we should stay away from. Right. 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 And nobody wants that. Nobody wants that. And um, and frankly, this is more fun. Yeah. This is a lot more fun to just talk about wine cellar as a as a scent. But to go to the numbers uh, for which we can do without getting into too much trouble. Okay. Victoria's Secret. Uh, the, so the comp sales for the whole brand were down two percent. They were in store. They were down six percent, which is uh, another data point about. The reduced attractiveness of having a lot of mall-based stores, and that is what Victoria's Secret is largely saddled with. And on top of that, they have a couple of announced departures, and the Victoria's Secret CEO uh, is departing. Uh, that's not the, the the L Brands CEO is is another individual, but the Victoria's Secret 
CEO is a very, very important part of the company, and uh, she's departing. And so that is yet another thing on top of uh, you know the, the dividend cut uh, and the decreased comps. And it's just I don't I don't know where the good news is is in here. And this is a, this is something which a couple of years ago I think you could have said, well, what store, what fashion um, brand do you have more confidence? In just continually getting it right and not missing missing the fashion trend and where things are going, because that happens to all fashion brands sooner or later. And now, including this one, uh, they're just on the wrong side of where their customers want to shop. Uh, one last uh, scent uh, on the Bath and Body Works candles, and I again, I, I'm not really sure what this is. There's a scent entitled "Tis the Season." There you go. Tis the season. Uh, speaking of which, uh, you can follow us on Twitter at MarketFoolery. We've got a tweet from uh, Tom Krikus. I hope I'm pronouncing Tom's last name correctly. You get in trouble I if know. you mispronounce it. Well, names. not everyone's as, as harsh with their judgment as you. Or, or the Swedes. <laughs> You don't. You don't want to. You don't want to get them mad. Don't, don't get the Swedes Our mad. Good friends uh, from Sweden. Uh, Tom writes. I know we haven't had. Uh, I know we haven't even had Thanksgiving yet. But I am so looking forward to what Market Foolery has in store for this year's Christmas playlist. Uh, for those who are relatively new to this podcast, for the last few years, in the month of December, producer Dan Boyd works his magic, and really, it's. It, I don't think it's an overstatement, Dan, to say that we're doing this as a public service. Oh, totally. You know, you you hear what the same forty-five Christmas songs every year on the radio stations. Our one of our local radio station has already switched over to all Christmas music all the time, and it's songs that I've heard. You know. It's just uncountable amounts, yeah. and I think we try to do what we try to do is cool. Is we try to bring people Christmas music that you're not necessarily going to hear on the radio or in the malls or on the soundtrack to your Hallmark Channel Christmas movie or whatever you're doing. <laughs> exactly, you, you need that sometimes, though. You, the old standbys, but you also need to learn about some new ones. I mean, there there are some old standbys that are that are yes, wonderful classic tunes, but. But you get enough of them everywhere else. Yeah, yeah. expand yeah. expand your playlist, and that's all. You know, we're look, to do. it's Barker's over here. He's 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 doing it, doing it every single time. Whenever I come on the show, he's like, "Well, actually, guys, what you're doing <laughs> is wrong." No, no, no. I'm not. I'm just. I'm reflecting on a time there was an election a couple of years ago. I'm not going to say what election it was, uh, but uh, I I just I needed a little. Uh, the day after, I needed to tune out politics, and there there was nothing more comforting than going back to Christmas songs. <laughs> That I had heard hundreds and thousands of times uh, uh, for my drive into work that day, uh, as as out of you know place as Christmas music in early mid November would be, nevertheless. Uh, and I, I'm, those occasions, thankfully, uh, you know, election post election um, despondency for you know whoever has it at whatever time. Uh, it only comes a couple of, every couple of years. So. Uh, that actually sounds very nice. So, um, so yes, Tom. The the holiday tunes are coming. They are coming at the end of next week uh, when we have, for the first time in a very long time, an apropos of nothing episode. Uh, we're going to be recording that next week, and that'll that will kick off our holiday music. You, me, and a special guest. A special guest who has never appeared on Apropos of Nothing before. Uh, and if you're listening to this saying to yourself, what in the world is Apropos of Nothing? Uh, it's the rare episode where we come in here and just talk about uh, nothing to do with business. It's just rambling. Although, one topic, I think, as a sneak preview of the Apropos of Nothing, um, this was a suggestion of the special guest, the smallest hill you're willing to die on. I like that as a topic. Yeah. Was that of all hills, or was that specific to the thing we were about going to write? No, I think it was just of 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 all the hills that you you're willing to die on. What's the smallest one? Okay, and you're taking requests for for topics. Yeah, if people want to email or, or tweet at us, like, hey, kick this. I question think there around. was there was one that's in the uh, quite likely to do list. Yes, uh, was that one of the requests that somebody sent in. Yes, and I've already forgotten what it is, but I have it saved in my email. So. Yeah, I, I can remind you later. Okay. Um, you can read more from Bill Barker and his colleagues. Just go to mfamfunds. That's mfamfunds.com. 
And the website looks fantastic. They had a whole makeover, and it's it's wonderful. So check it out because um, we're not going to be here Wednesday or Thursday. Um, happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. This is your big holiday. Yes, very excited. Although it is going to be, as one headline I saw, it's going to be the coldest Thanksgiving in Boston in over 100 years. So that's I'm I'm bracing myself for and that. And you're going going out running in that, you say. It it remains to be determined if the annual 5K race is going to happen for me personally. I, since it won't be rainy, why not? <laughs> because right now it's looking like it's going to be below zero. Hey, you just burn off a few more calories trying to uh, not know, freeze to death. Keep the hypothermia at bay. There you that go. That just leaves room for more stuffing. Can't argue with that kind of logic. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being here. Thank you. As always, people on the program may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and the Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against. So don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear. That's going to do it for this edition of Market Flurry. The show is mixed by Dan Boyd. I'm Chris Hill. Thanks for listening. We'll see you on Monday.